Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to today's extraordinarily special uh, lesson about the Electoral College. It is Election Day in America, a day that happens once every four years, if we're talking about the presidential election. And every four years, Americans have the debate and discussion about what is known as the Electoral College. The Electoral College is the way we elect the president. And today, rather than having you take notes on this, I just want you to listen, and we are going to have a class discussion and debate about the usefulness or the lack of usefulness of the Electoral College. So we're having a general election today. So what happens in a general election? I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. Um, basically, these are the things that happen. We are choosing the President and Vice President of the United States to start a four-year term that begins on January 20th, 2017, and will last until January 20th of 2021. Uh, we are electing one-third of the senators. There are 100 senators, so there are 33 Senate races on the ballot today. And we are electing all 435 members of the House of Representatives. The president is elected through what we call the Electoral College. And this is a bizarre system we're the only country in the world that has it, and it is the reason the map changes color on election night. Senators are elected by a plurality vote in their states, meaning whoever gets the most votes, whether it's above 50% or not, wins. So if you have three or four candidates running against each other, whichever one gets the most votes becomes the senator from that state for the next six years. And then members of the House of Representatives are elected by individual districts. Um, I showed you that in our lesson on the legislative branch. And depending on which state you live in, there are a different number of districts. So let's talk about the Electoral College because it is the subject of today's debate. Um, what you see here are two elections, the 2000 election, the closest election in our lifetimes and the 2012 electoral map where Obama defeated, President Obama defeated Mitt Romney by 332 electoral votes to 206. Each state gets a number of electors based on its members of Congress. Remember the House is based on population, the Senate is based on two senators per state. So Oregon, for example, has five representatives and two senators, so we have seven electoral votes. California is the big kahuna at 55, and no state has fewer than three. The electors are actual live human beings who are going to vote for president. So when you vote for president, you're not voting for president. You are voting for people who promise to vote for the candidate you want them to vote for. In, that, in the case of Oregon, that would be seven people. All of the electors from a state vote for the candidate that the people of that state voted for. So whoever wins a state, that entire slate of electors is required, theoretically, to vote for that presidential candidate. Whoever gets the most electoral votes for president wins so long as they get more than 270 electoral votes. 270 is the magic number. It is possible for a candidate to win more votes across the country and lose the Electoral College. In the year 2000, President Bush was elected. He got 650,000 fewer votes than Al Gore across the country, but because he won um, Florida's 25 electoral votes, he won the Electoral College 271 to 266. That has happened three times in our history, 1872, 1888 and 2000. And that's out of quite a few elections in our history. So just think on that for a minute. Today I would like to have a debate in class. Should the Electoral College be replaced? And I'm going to give you some arguments on both sides of it. I, I hope you think about these arguments and I hope that you take them seriously. First of all, these are arguments for keeping the Electoral College. First of all, every vote should count equally everywhere in the country. Actually, these are, these are arguments for replacing the Electoral College. Let me be very specific about that. 
So if you believe that every vote should count equally everywhere in the United States of America, you would definitely advocate for getting rid of the Electoral College, because depending on which state you vote in, you either have more or less political power to choose the President of the United States and the Vice President. Losers should not win. We have had three elections where the candidate who lost the popular vote became president, most recently in the year 2000. George W. Bush would not have been president if the Electoral College did not exist. Um, and it's also believed candidates should campaign everywhere in the country. As we've seen this year, the candidates only go to states that could go either way. If a state like Oregon or California is going to go overwhelmingly for the Democratic candidate, the Hillary Clintons and the Barack Obamas of the world are not going to visit us. If a state like Texas is going to vote overwhelmingly for Donald Trump or Mitt Romney, they're not going to visit those states because they're pretty much in the bag. If you have every vote everywhere count equally, candidates would likely go to the big cities and the high population centers because they would have the largest impact on the race. They would also go to places like Texas because Houston, Dallas are large cities. They would go to California because San Francisco and Los Angeles are large cities. So you could make the argument that that would be better. And you would no longer see candidates just visiting certain states, which is pretty much what's happened. You've seen the candidates all over the place in Florida, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, Nevada, um, states basically that could go either way. And that only makes sense because of the Electoral College. That's how we elect the president. If you want to keep the Electoral College, these would be your arguments. First, candidates would only go to big cities where all the voters are. You would never see candidates in rural areas. You would never see candidates in small states um, because they would be irrelevant. Of course, they're already irrelevant. No one goes to North or South Dakota to campaign for president because they're usually in the bag for Republicans. So that's kind of the case already, but the argument would be that you would only see the candidates in the large cities because that's where the most votes would be. And smaller states actually matter more under the Electoral College. Your Montanas, your Alaskas, your North and South Dakotas, your Wyomings all have more power with their three electoral votes than they would have if we had a system where every vote counted the same in every single state. Um, there's also the argument that it is a federal system and that it encourages our system of federalism by having 50 separate state elections rather than one election. It's also tradition and history. Americans have gotten used to watching that map change colors on election night, and so they want to keep it that way. But if you end up with a president who shouldn't be president because they weren't elected by all of the people, like the year 2000, that's when it gets controversial, folks. So now I want you to take a side. I want you to write down whether you are pro or con of getting rid of the Electoral College and write down some of your reasons. We're going to have you discuss it, and we're going to have you take sides and debate it in front of the whole class. And I'm going to explain that to you in just a moment, folks. So here is the basis of our argument. Should the Electoral College be replaced? I'm signing off.